Thanks for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast with my guest today, John Doe of X. If you like what you hear today, remember to like it, review it, share it with everyone you know. You can also follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for regular updates on upcoming episodes, and that way you don't miss out on all the good stuff that's yet to come. Thanks to Metro Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram of Chicopee. Stop by their state-of-the-art dealership between Big Y and BJ's on Memorial Drive or stop by MetroJeep.com and drive away in your new Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram today. Now let's get into today's episode of Baxi's Musical Podcast. Baxi's Musical Podcast. I think if we all thought long and hard about it, we could all come up with a list of bands and musical artists that may have overstayed their welcome by, I don't know, two or three decades. I'm not going to name names, but I think the Rolling Stones know who I'm talking about. Other times, you'll hear about a band breaking up too soon, leaving a lasting legacy of fans and media types asking questions about what it would take to get the band back together. Unfortunately, a lot of breakups are due to apparent unsolvable conflicts and disagreements, making some reunions seem inconceivable. What you don't often find are those that end things on their own terms and punctuate their final bow with dignity and grace. And closing things off with a final recorded statement that lives up to some of their best work. That's usually not how it works. Usually, the last tour supports an album that lies somewhere between a flaccid piece of garbage and pure horseshit. That is unless you're John Doe, Billy Zoom, Exene Cervenka, and DJ Bonebrink, the four original members of X. Since 1980, X have released some of the most critically praised albums of the last 45 years. From their highly touted debut album, Los Angeles, to their insanely great 1981 follow-up, The Wild Gift, to one of my favorites, Under the Big Black Sun from 1982, and even their unexpected 2020 comeback album, Alphabet Land, which was their first album of new material in 27 years, X is simply one of the best American rock bands ever. And it's not just me saying this. X is a band that has achieved tremendous critical praise throughout their entire run. In fact, in 2003, Rolling Stone listed their first two albums amongst the top 500 best albums of all time. And while Rolling Stone album lists are often deeply flawed, when it comes to Los Angeles at number 286 and The Wild Gift at number 334, I give Rolling Stone at least a little bit of credit for including them on the list. But yet after seven more albums, the band has announced that their latest release, Smoke and Fiction, will be their last. On top of that, X has also announced that this will be their final tour, which includes their appearance in Boston on September 23rd at the Wilbur Theater. It's a tour that takes them through the end of October, and then that appears to be it. Or does it? But here's the thing, though. Unlike many bands that end their careers with a whimper, X is going out with one of their best albums in years. Even better, in my opinion, than their critically praised last album, which is really saying something. How can we stop them from quitting? I'm not sure, but I'm going to try my best. This is why it is so great to welcome back John Doe from X on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Hey, how are you doing? Excellent. Wonderful to have you. Actually, uh, I interviewed you uh, four years ago, just before the release of the last album, Alphabet Land. And it was, uh, you know, obviously, it's the first album of new material and 27 years or however long it was and and the first time that you recorded with billy since 1985 and i mean critics just you know were tripping all over themselves over that record but to be honest i i actually think the new record smoke and fiction is even better i mean it you know it's hard to release one good album it's even harder to make a better one tell me about the record and the decision to to do it at all well that's a lot but i'll (laughs) dive in um sometime in um december or november of 22 somebody said to me well you know we're making a record (laughs) and we're going to put it out in june and i said we had no songs and i said really that's curious i thought that i would have been at that meeting (laughs) i thought i would have gotten that memo you should have been Uh, consulted (laughs) i think it was just uh, wishful thinking is what i think I, i believe I'm going to say it was wishful thinking. Um, so after I got adjusted to the fact that we're making a record, 
uh, <laughs> I got to work with Hexane and uh, said, send me a bunch of lyrics. And I had some stuff. And then we uh, got busy and wrote. And then we would rehearse. And then we would tour. And then we would rewrite and learn that version of the song. And it was hard, to be perfectly honest, just at... I think the pace of what we did things, you know, doing, trying to do several things at once. And um, uh, that's, that's, I think where I first got, where we first got the clue that this may be uh, a final record because we weren't sure that we could mount that sort of campaign again. Yeah. Given our, that we're a little less young. <laughs> Yeah. I, I stole that from I stole that from Mike Watt. Mike Watt never says the O L D word. He says less young. <laughs> probably, uh, probably pretty wise. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've read that you know, none of you went into this with the idea of recording a, a final album, but you know, it became obvious during the recording that this was the direction that it was that it was heading. How did that present itself? And 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 what was I mean? What was that conversation like between the four of you? Oh, we never talk about stuff in depth. We just do things. There's, there's, there's a, we're the opposite of, um, you know, doing group therapy. <laughs> uh, I thought musically that these songs represented the scope of, of what X does. And there was one track that was left off that DJ wrote. It was a jazz number. I wanted it to be on because it was so weird and different, but everybody else thought, no, nah, it's it doesn't fit. This yeah. this does what doesn't fit with the others, you know that that song right. or game. So that'll be on the next final album. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be on a that'll be on a B side somewhere. But um, like "Sweet to the Bitter End" is maybe Bo Diddley with some Johnny Burnett trio, "Train Kept a Rollin," and um, "Big Black X" may be a little bit of a a kind of a T Rex, which we never mm. really did much of. Uh, "Smoke and Fiction" is a bit like in this house that I call home and the struggle is surreal is maybe the most like the Ramones that, that, that we do face in the moon was written and rewritten. And I had a whole different story to it. The only thing that we kept was the chorus lines that Exene wrote. I see your face in the moon waxing and waning. So confused. That's pretty much all. There was a whole yeah. different like a uh, kidnapping story where the kidnapper is killed <laughs> and uh Exene loves to play with words and so lyrically we had a lot of wordplay in like flip side and smoke and fiction which is one of my favorite lyrics that that we did that's like the uh the, the chorus uh i still talk a little bit but there's no words for this and and it's like you you, you can't exactly express how you feel about about everything that's going on but you're going to try and you still hurt a little bit, but there's no cure for it and pray and wish and things like that. But, you know, like a lot of X songs, you know, as I'm listening to the record, they all tend to tell a story. And, and, yes. and, and many of the songs on Smoke and Fiction certainly do that. And some of them have a real definitive sense of closure to them. It, like, for example, one of the ones that popped out to me was the way it is. It yes. seems like a goodbye. Like it, there is something final about it, but yet, on you know, winding up the time, it almost sounds like there's some mixed emotions involved. Are there mixed emotions for you guys with the with the closure of all of this? Well, I mean, we're going to continue to tour, just not 75 days a year. <laughs> that's actually that actually turns into more like a hundred plus. And going, I don't know if you've been on tour, but touring is extremely hard. Sure. So coming in and out of, we just tour in vans, you know sprinter sprinter vans but we don't we don't fly <laughs> to gigs <laughs> i know this is going to ruin your image of us we don't we don't have a big we don't have a couple of buses that we travel with um and uh we're less young so there's not that kind of closure but um with this with uh the way it is it was actually written i started writing it on the um this outlaw country cruise the West Coast edition. So Lucinda was there, uh, Lucinda Williams and Los Lobos and uh, some of the uh, long riders. 
mm. and uh, Steve Earle and, and a bunch of people that we've come up with. And it was um, bittersweet, but it, it, it talks about the present and the past and how you have to, you have to bring those together and you have to get right with them. You have to accept that you might not have acted admirably. You might honorably uh, in the past, but you accept it and, and you, you learn something from it. And that's more that reconciliation and, 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 and owning things. I mean, to like yourself unconditionally, you may not be proud of something that you did, but you did it anyway. And, and it, towards the end of that song, it, it says, uh, that's the way it's, if it's in the past, that's the way it's got to be. And if it's the future, it's the way it's going to be. You know, you're, you're, you're going to carry on. You know, I, I saw an interview that, uh, that you and Exena did, uh, had done a, like just a couple months ago. And, and during that interview, she said something to the effect that, you know, that you can't completely predict the future, you know, who knows what's, what's going to happen. But with you guys, it's been 47 years. you got nine incredible albums under your belt. And, and like you said, no one's getting any younger uh, here. But it, it still represents you know, a major part of your lives. Now that decisions have been, have been made and you see the direction this is going, how are you feeling about it? I mean, is, is, there, is there a sense of finality? Is there a sense of you know, second-guessing this decision? How, what are those feelings like? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we may have to eat our words. We may, like in 2025, we may have to say, oh, fuck, <laughs> we're not going to be broke. Right. The plan is, you know, you make a plan and see if it works. So the plan is that we're going to play 20 shows. Right. We're going to do a Little Steven's garage, uh, underground garage tour. And um, we might do some shows with Los Lobos or some other kind of combination. And um, I, I don't feel, I, I feel like things are just, are reaching a different, can reach a different level so that you don't have to break your back and you can be a little choosier. It's funny because as you're talking about this, I keep thinking like about the B-52s. You know, they're currently on, on the longest farewell tour I've ever heard of in my life. It's like, no, yeah, this is the no, last no. show, but first. We're not, saying, uh, we're, we're not saying a last, we're not saying a last show. If we could, if we could fill the Hollywood bowl. <laughs> yeah. I could say, okay, fine. That's a last show. Yeah. Well, they've said, but you know, the B-52 well, is going to be a last show, but, but first a residency in Las Vegas. God bless them. They had some hits. They can play any, uh, any state fair they want to, they can play any casino they want to. We, we can't do that. So what we, I can, I can, yes, I can speak for the band, but myself, especially, I don't want to be part of something that's falling apart. Right. I don't want to be part of something where it's like, oh yeah, that's our third guitar player. I mean, God bless anybody who wants to, who, who's, who's doing that. Go for it. Yeah. I don't, I don't really, I'm not going to judge them, but we have, we're a little bit of the last band standing, Los Lobos included. They're on 50 years. Wow. So I'm just glad the coach can still put us in. Well, I mean, you know, most bands at the end of their career, however it ends or, or whatever, you know, don't typically record a great record. It's usually they go out whimpering with a, with a half-assed effort and, and that's not that great. And that's, that's not what you've done. And as a fan, you know, I'm kind of wrestling with the idea of being sad that it appears to be coming to an end, but then thrilled by the fact that you're going to go out swinging for the fences, you know, by, by scheduling this tour and coming up with a record that's, that's as good, you know, as it is, especially, you know, as you say, you know, you, you're not young or <laughs> you're, you're non, whatever it may be, but he said, know, he said less young, less young. Thank you. Thank young. you. But you know, it, it's, it's not like X has an awful lot to prove to its fans. But so, so from a fan's perspective, it's kind of like, this is bittersweet for, for us. It, it may have a different effect for you, but I know as a fan, it's like, man, I don't, I don't want to see X go. We're, we're not, we're not going, going, yeah. but I, I, I appreciate that. And, and the fact that people have said, you saved my life, you changed my life. That means a lot to all of us. And and we we want to maintain that that position. So I I I don't I don't that that's where I don't feel the finality of it because 
were in history books. I, I wrote a couple of those punk rock books right. or was part of it. And so, yeah, we did our thing. And and it's not a whole lot that I'm, I'm proud of 90% of it. That's a still pre- a, a pretty good percentage. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, adding 900 in a, on a 47 year career. <laughs> Pretty good. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, the, the batting, I mean, not to use it in the baseball reference, but the batting average for X has been pretty high over, over the, uh, the course of, of those 47 years. But, you know, you know, I understand when you say that that music has meant things to people and, you know, different songs mean things to, to, to different, to different people. And I, and for whatever reason, there are certain, some, there are certain songs that I hear, but I could, I could listen to, again and again you know, hungry wolf los angeles uh, i could you know white girl i could go on forever with it all of those are in the set list of Baxi. course i would hope so i list. i would well, be indignant if that if that wasn't the case <laughs> so with it being as it is let me see if i can uh, if i can uh, make things interesting for you here i have in my hand a personal check in the amount of 137 dollars and 48 cents for you guys to continue to record forever now before you answer you point out that that would be $34.37 a piece. I know it's a very generous offer, but would that be enough to record another album? No. Are you <laughs> sure? <laughs> I'll go to, I'll take it to committee. Okay, right. good. Yeah. Talk to, talk to Billy and DJ and XE and, and, and then get back to me and let's, you know, we'll, I'll, we'll haggle. I'll be, like, I'll, I'll be like when your parents are being really shitty and say, well, <laughs> We'll see. Okay, good. Good to know. You know, over the last couple of years, you know, since I started doing this podcast, you know, I've, I've, I've interviewed a number of people and in, in my radio career, same thing. And, you know, I interviewed a lot of people that were, you were present in Los Angeles when you guys were starting 1977, you know, into the early eighties in Los Angeles. And, and there's always been this pretty remarkable level of reverence that people have had for X. And it's not just a few people, it's many people have had this respect for what you guys have done when you were starting this out you know there wasn't like there was a a a major plan or blueprint to follow and everybody in that scene was kind of kind of going through you know the growing pains at the same time who were some of the bands that you respected at at the time where you said oh my gosh they're they're really good Who, who was standing out for you back then Oh, the the greatest unsung hero was were the uh, screamers, because they were such a immersive show. They were theatrical, and everyone anticipated their their because they didn't play very much. The plugs were outstanding, and unfortunately, it's it's really difficult to get their second record. Better luck is uh, it's like hundreds of dollars to get a, a a copy of their of the vinyl. Yeah, Tito was a Tito and and Barry and Chalo were just a such a tight band. And uh, I remember one time I I was talking to Tito about songwriting, and I said, you know, it's just more of a one four five progression, which is a typical blues and country progression. And he said, what's that? <laughs> I said. Oh dear boy, uh, you're so good without knowing those tropes. Yeah, right. It's interesting because you know a lot of the times those compliments that I've heard about X are coming from the hardcore guys. Yeah. What I've always found really fascinating about X is is that you're considered a punk band. I don't even know if it's a good characterization of what X was, sure. but the, yeah. but but you know there were a, a number of bands that were kind of focused on American roots country type of music i mean the uh the gun club uh, you know the, the the blasters you guys i mean even even the the, the minutemen t- to me always sounded more like a like an esoteric jazz trio more than like a hardcore band i would never put them in that category but that was part of the function of punk rock from from the beginning you look all the look at all the bands that came out of cbgb's look at all the bands that came out of london in that uh original era and and the Gun Club and Blasters and 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 Los Lobos and uh, Tex and the Horseheads and and people like that, that was like a little second wave coming in, but that ec- eclectic mix was because punk rock wasn't 
codified. It wasn't defined as something that happened, I think, later on. Yeah. I think after after the SST bands toured their asses off, slept on everybody's fucking floor and and did their thing and really developed that whole underground path of of gigs triple jerks all, all those guys uh, we weren't willing to do that it was like sleep on somebody's floor fuck no i don't want to do that <laughs> but i'm not going to be a prima donna right so i'll play in somebody's basement not a person's but we'll play at the in the basement of um some uh the, it was a club quote that was at a uh in berkeley at at one of the like residence halls it was a total fucking fire trap as the mask was so <laughs> sure we'll do that yeah so the the but regarding the the reverence that people may have i think they would have that for anybody who was true to themselves and and we had certain standards but we were always pretty uh, accessible we yeah. didn't it wasn't like we were sonic youth and just played whatever we thought up and just did that right um we had verses and choruses and pretty traditional in that way because at the beginning we we thought okay there's rock and roll music and then there's garage rock and then there's like psychedelic music and then there's more garage rock and then there's then the next version might just be punk rock and and we won't be the beatles but maybe we'll be the zombies or the animals and we'll be a, a you know and I think the Ramones and Blondie and Talking Heads and and um, some of the other bands, maybe maybe the Clash, to a degree, although they were much more about the like experience of of just do your thing. But we we're not going to sell out, but we want a record company to kind of buy in and say, okay. By the time we got signed to Electra, it was more like, well, we're going to sign. We, we've been <laughs> we've been shamed into signing this band. <laughs> because we put out two records on Slash and sold out the Greek theater, which is like 7,000 seats in Los Angeles. And we're on a fucking indie record label. And it's like, oh, Christ, I guess we got to sign it. We'll treat them like an art project. <laughs> right. We won't mess with them because we don't know. But you guys had something that was pretty extraordinary. And, and that was Ray Manzarek. You know, you know, yes. Los Angeles, the wild gift under the big black sun, you know, more fun in the new world. Ray produced yes. all, all four of those records. And Love yeah. And you know, I, I mean, I've had the, the chance to interview him a, a couple of times when he was alive and it, well, first of all, it's hard to imagine he's been gone for 11 years. Secondly, he just always seemed to me to be just a, an incredibly thoughtful and intelligent and, and affable person and to have someone like that. A, you know, of that caliber become a mentor for you guys and to be such a huge part of, of your career. What a gift that had to be to have a Ray Van Zarek in your it corner and loving your band. Yeah. It blew me away when, when, when he, when he approached, I wish that I remember exactly what that first meeting was like at the whiskey. Cause he, I know that he, he saw us and then came back and said, hello, but what he did was he didn't use a bunch of tricks in recording. Yeah. He did great performances. That, that was his thing. He didn't try to fix something that wasn't broken because a lot of producers want to put their juju or their stamp on it. And in that way, Rob Schnaff is similar, who did Alphabet Land and, and this one. So... It's it's like intuition. People will say, "Well, what's your what's your thing you learned the most?" It's like to trust your intuition because if you feel it from like your head and your heart, or your heart and your head, like I like the way that sounds. I don't like the way that looks. If you don't like it, then just trust your yeah. little voice because it's telling you the truth. And Ray was Ray was very in touch with that. Yeah. I think one of the things that, that he did for you that I think was a real great benefit, especially for those first four records, you know, when you listen to, you know, records of that time, so many of them were recorded and sounded like, they sounded like shit. I mean, they were recorded badly. They sounded like they were recorded yeah. in, a, in a closet half the time. 
but the way he yep. produced those records, they never sound dated. They they never sound like they they never not sounded great. I mean, they all sounded like they were given the care and attention that each one of those records really deserved. That was a pretty intuitive thing for him to have done because he could very easily have done what everybody else was doing at the time, and it wouldn't have landed in the same kind of way. I I, I think that was a, a real benefit to his to his experience as, as it related to you guys. Yeah, well, I mean, we did that with uh, Danger House and those and those that first single and the first recording of Los Angeles did sound like shit. Yeah. Because we didn't have any money. Then Bob Biggs from Slash said, we'll give you 10 grand. And Billy had, was friends with, with someone who, so I'd, I'd give Billy some credit, a, a lot of credit on that as well, because Billy found the studio, which was uh, part of, um, kind of part of that Ocean Way annex thing. It was called um, Golden Sound. It was just down the street from there. Ray knew how to, knew it sounded good. Then we then we also graduated to like Cherokee, which is still a, a pretty great studio. But we didn't have to wait. We didn't want to wait until we got the big deal. That's that's what happened with the plugs. That's what happened with the Alley Cats. That's what happened with the Weirdos. Is they they wanted they were waiting for like the the major label deal. Yeah. And and we thought, well, fuck that. We want to make a record now. We had been a band for two and a half three years. What, yeah. what was what was the reaction from? I mean, okay, so you know, Ray Manzarek is working working with X. It's a pretty heavyweight guy. Very, you, you're working with the with, yeah. that that reaction was very mixed. I, I would have to think it would be because I mean I remember you know, you're reading interviews with other rock stars at, at at the time in 1977, completely discounting you know the whole punk thing, and some were even threatened by it, or they all had different reactions to it. I I, I can't imagine what some people were doing when they realized. Who was working with you? That mean that had to be kind of like a, you know, kind of like a, a, a red flag warning for people. Yeah. What are you working with that dinosaur for? <laughs> right. But he, but I would imagine even for him, they're probably saying, what are you working with these punks for? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not privy to that. But Ray had just, uh, he had tried to do a band with Iggy, I think, yeah. for a minute. And um, he was always, I mean, from what he told us, he was attracted to us first by reading a, a pretty long article in a free paper called the LA Reader, uh, kind of like the LA Weekly. And um, Chris Morris, who's uh, still a friend, uh, he had written this article and he printed a lot of lyrics about it. He printed some lyrics from Johnny Hit and Run Pauline mm -hmm. and some lyrics from the Plugs and the Alley Cats and some other bands. And he and and reading the article, Ray thought, well, the connection between these bands and their audience is very much is very similar to what I experienced with the Doors. And it was only like eight years later, seven years later, from 1970 to 1977, or maybe you saw us in 78, whatever. It's like, it seems like an enormous gulf of time. It's like eight years. <laughs> the fuck? It's a blink so, of an eye. So, but but he saw poetry and he he thought, well, I want to, I want to find out what's happening. And, and yeah, you're, you're right. Ray was uh, a great mentor. He was really positive. He talked the talk and he walked the walk when it came to sort of the ether and spirituality and reincarnation and, and all this all this nutty kind of pre-New Age Eastern influenced religion. And and that kind of turned our started turning our heads like sideways and <laughs> what? You mean, <laughs> yeah. He also introduced us to, to sushi. He being from Baltimore, Exine being from Chicago and Florida. It's like, what's sushi? <laughs> what is this magical? Yes. Send, this is a cook. Send it back. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I think we talked about after the, the last album, you know, it was, it was the return of, of Billy Zoom to X. And uh, mm -hmm. and I have you know, always felt that Billy, I mean, you all have you all have wonderful talents, and you all have contributed to this band in in ways that are completely immeasurable. But I think Billy is maybe one of the most unsung guitar heroes, maybe ever. He is he is such a great guitar player, and there's just something about the way he plays. 
that's really very special. Tell me about about Billy and you know, getting him back and being able to play with him again after all those years that that uh, that he was gone. Oh, uh, I enjoyed playing with Dave Alvin, uh, and then when Dave said, "Listen, my good friend John Doe, my brother Philip has sung all my songs up until now." And I don't think I want you to sing all my songs from now into the future. So it's been sweet making See How We Are and I'll See You Later. And Tony Gilkerson was was up to the challenge. And he said, okay, cool, uh, I'll do this. Um, at some point in about like 98 um, or 97, I don't know, it's hard to say. 96, let's say. Okay. 96, 97. Exine and I came to the realization through talking to friends and so forth that we were no longer doing punk rock. We had morphed into some alt rock thing and we were not playing big places. We were playing to two, 300 people. And we thought, well, this is disappointing. <laughs> and other friends of ours, people that we, you know, that talked to us about what we were doing said, why don't you just play fucking punk rock? And we thought, hmm, that's a good idea. Why don't we just do what, we, what we're good at? <laughs> and and the songs that we've written that are like punk rock. And um, at that point, we asked Tony if he wanted to continue uh, doing X with playing more punk rock. And he said, no, not really. So we said, okay, time out. It's time for a hiatus. And we were the only time that the X was not a band was about a year and a half and then someone from x files approached us to do a cover of crystal ship which is the only like song in that movie and we thought mm. great so we did that with billy and it was it was fun and billy said i well yes i think i would come back and play with you guys wow and we thought, cool this means that we can play punk rock and billy wants to do it and that was i think 98 99 something like that but it was a long period, but from 85 uh, at the end of Ain't Love Grand through uh, See How We Are, Jesus, um, Live at the Whiskey, all that stuff. Like, it was good over 10 years, like yeah. 12 years. But I, I agree. Billy is uh, is somewhat unsung. He, he, is, uh, he has taken all of his lessons from Merle Travis to Chuck Berry to... Les Paul to all the other uh, early jazz, Django Reinhardt. Anyway, he he and and you know his first instrument was uh, were woodwinds. So hmm. he knows a lot of and and he does he does Billy Zoom great and he gets all the credit in the world for bringing rock and roll guitar Chuck Berry rockabilly guitar into punk rock. Yeah. Robert Quine, a little bit. Robert Quine had some of the Chuck Berry uh, licks and stuff like that and, and applied them to Matthew Sweet and and uh, Richard Hell. But nobody else was playing like, na 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 It's like, oh, that fits perfectly. Like I said, I, I've, I've always I've always loved the way he plays and, and, and to have him back, it was awesome. John, I'm I'm so happy we had the, a, a chance to talk. Uh, you know, again, I, I I'm sure again you hear us all the time. You know, X has been such a a, a big part of of my life for so long that you know, that it is hard to imagine even a discussion about a final album or final tour or whatever it may be. You know, and I got plenty of documented proof in my record collection that X yes. will always exist. Uh, you know, in in some way in in, in my life. So l let me just say this, and I, and I and I and I do mean this in in all sincerity. If you need me to send you that check, let me know, because I'd be more I'll, than happy to pop it in the mail in two or three days. Here's my phone. I'm going to text the <laughs> band right now. I'm texting them right now. Okay, hundred and thirty-seven dollars oh. and forty-eight cents. Uh, how much is it again? Hundred and thirty-seven. Hundred and thirty-seven dollars and forty-eight cents. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to actually write that in a magic marker. I have a I have a permanent uh, archival. This is an archival pen right here, Baxi. <laughs> so it'll never fade. It was one thirty-seven and forty-eight cents. Forty-eight cents. That's thirty-four thirty-seven a piece. Yes. Work with those numbers. Mill it around in your head for a little while, and you know we. 
<laughs> we'll see no, what the um, results are. There's, there's uh, there are occasions where I get some, uh, well, like on a quarterly basis, I get residual checks for acting. Oh yeah, you did a lot of acting. And this is and this has taught me something that's that's interesting, is that I will get a check for one cent, <laughs> and I think it costs more to process this. It costs like a hundred times more to process this than what it is. And I've taken to just like looking at those, laughing up, and then throwing them away because <laughs> it's not worth my time to do the, you know, uh, <laughs> to upload them on your phone. Yeah. Or drive to a bank. Yeah. I awesome. can imagine. Anyway, so, but then there's occasions where I'll get $10 and there's other occasions where I'll get a hundred dollars. Well, that's worth and going I mean, to a bank. There are other people that are that on those zeros. <laughs> There are many zeros attached to them where they may get like a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. So it's all the number of zeros. Like I could lend you, I could lend you fifty bucks without blinking an eye, even just for this. Right. I would lend you fifty bucks. Well, I appreciate that. You don't have to do that. I'm not asking for it. You know that. But <laughs> if there's somebody else that would that would be in a position to lend you dollars without blinking an eye, and I think. Wow, that's fucking crazy. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> it's an apartment or a house for like fifteen thousand dollars a month, and you think, who are these people? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> well, for, for the thirty-four, thirty-seven that each one of you would get, I mean, that's a that's yes. a package of tube socks. That's maybe like a couple of you know packages of chicken, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, you know, I'd be more than happy to to to, to make that right. a reality for you. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna get a uh, uh, an email. <laughs> going from um <laughs> i'm gonna get an email going for uh, for for this and and we will get back to you perfect john it's Appreciate a pl it's a pleasure to talk to you best of luck on the on the uh, on the rest of the tour and uh and uh, thank you so much and and thank you for your offer of 137 dollars <laughs> because this has added a a certain amount of joy to my life and i will remark to my wife about this and it was a gas and uh it's like this is something that like david letterman would do and if i can put you and david letterman in the same group right i i would think his check could be a little bit better than that but you know no, what he, i'm he, giving till he it hurts with, <laughs> but he would come up with some absurd thirty-seven dollars and 48 cents where, where are you based out of uh massachusetts springfield massachusetts well you know that we're playing Derry, New uh, Hampshire. New Hampshire, yeah. We're playing there, and we're going to play in Boston. Yes, and we're also playing in in Albany. So I'm sure you know somebody that you could, you might want to go there with. Well, so come. I I have seen X before, and I loved it, and it would be it would be a real pleasure to see you again. I'll get you in free. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, John. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye bye. bye. The name of the new X album is called Smoke and Fiction, and it is fantastic. Don't forget, they're coming to the Wilbur Theater in Boston on September 23rd. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. You can email me at bax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks to Metro Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, and Ram at Chickabee for their support. But most of all, thanks to you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.